Greetings and welcome to another episode of RCAF Podcast. My name is Andrew Norris. Thanks for being here. This week, my guest is Nomi Adana. Nomi is really one of my favorite painters. It's hard to genreify his style, but I think it has its roots in surrealism. And yeah, it's just every piece is very novel. Every painting is very novel. And that's what I like about his work. You can tell he's always poking around in the creative depths, trying to find just a new way to say hooray, as uh, Terrence McKenna would often quote. Nomi's also, what would you say, an original member of the further collaboration crew. Original member makes him sound kind of like a band and we actually draw those comparisons in this episode. And Nomi talks about his artistic origins in the Bay Area, San Francisco area, in conjunction with the underground art and music scene that was burgeoning there in the early 2000s, along with how he met all the guys in the further crew during that time period. We also talk about artistic process and the spectrum between having like a preformed idea going into a painting and on the other end of that spectrum just free flow brushwork guiding the way and we talk a bit about dreams consciousness routine and many other topics the newest subscriber to the patreon this week is none other than my guest on episode 93 Juan Manuel Sanabria go check out his work his instagram handle is jamasanabria find that link in the description and check out our podcast to get to know him a little better it's always a big boost in solidifying my resolve when former guests and artists whose work I love decide to support this show so thank you Juan I appreciate your support and guess what if you'd like to support you want to join the ranks of amazing artists supporting this project you can go to patreon.com slash podcast. There you'll find all the details on uh, what you're going to get if you decide to give me a little bit of, a little bit of fliff every month, a little bit of dough. Tiers are 4 8 and $16 per month. So for $48 a year, if you think this show is giving you that kind of value, maybe you don't. Maybe you just are balling on a budget like me and can't afford it that's okay that's great you can also share the podcast if you're feeling it and you're balling on a budget send it out to 10 of your friends 10 of your weirdo creative beautiful freaky friends and tell them how much you got out of some of your favorite episodes and yeah as always i appreciate your attention no matter what you're doing for me. I'm just glad that this is getting out into the world. And want to give one more shout out to Nomi. Thanks so much, man, for uh, for agreeing to come on this podcast and having an awesome conversation with me. Don't forget to check out Nomi at Nomi Adana on Instagram. Get this man up above 10,000 followers. I don't know why that's important. I guess because you can put links in your story and stuff. He probably doesn't care about that. But maybe, you know, every little bit helps. This art path isn't easy. So go show Nomi some love. And let's get right into this episode. Here is Nomi Adana. Yeah, Nomi, thank you for coming on. Thanks for taking the time, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's exciting. Yeah, really appreciate it. I'll I'll try not to uh, do the whole uh, that's awesome Chris Farley thing with you too much, but uh, just want to say <laughs> just want to say that like I, I really dig your art and um, really really an honor to talk to you. So thanks again. Appreciate it. And yeah. we'll. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll get out of this awkward area real quick. Usually how I start is I ask people about kind of their origin story 
um, in terms of, you know, making art, being an artist, being a painter. But I wanted to start a little different today because I noticed this quote at the end of uh, your email, and I'm just curious about about what it is and, and what it means to you. Um, and the quote is, dreaming is a continuous state. It's only that sometimes our eyes open and we become distracted from this eternity which dances inside of us. Mm. What is that? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I actually forgot that that's on there. I put that on there years ago. Um, I don't know. There's a there's a time in my life where I love sleeping, but not necessarily just to sleep, but the dreams. Like so many times when I was younger, I would wake up from a dream, as I'm sure most people do, and you're like, ah, I was just fucking jumping over buildings or you know whatever it is, right? Yeah. And then at some point. I just started having the thoughts of well, maybe that world that you go into is just as real and relevant as this waking world. Uh, I mean, both of them are being filtered through some kind of brain thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there are, I've come to find out, I think it's like in Indonesia or something, there's like different like dream tribes and stuff, and they feel that, that that world is, you know, just as relevant is this one so i think it's just that it's just kind of like consciousness like what is consciousness it's kind of questioning that whole thing yeah well sweet so maybe we can start um start from there like uh what's what's your overall take on consciousness do you think it's something that's or are you more on the like scientific side or are you more on like the panpsychism side that the whole thing is consciousness and we're just receiving it yeah i probably lean more towards that i'm not much of a materialist uh, i think there's a whole lot more going on that, that we can see or observe through science or our own you know, ways of measuring this world that we see around us so yeah i mean i've thought about it a lot and I don't really have any conclusive. I feel like, uh, yeah, there's just so much that we don't know. And I think, you know, to me, that's like one of the most amazing things about life is this great mystery. There's things that we're just probably never going to know. And that's one of them. And maybe, you know, maybe we'll be able to measure certain things at certain points or whatever, but Right now, if you talk to different scientists or spiritual people, everyone's got a different idea. It's like, oh, consciousness is created by electrical signals in your brain and your physiology. And that's more of a materialist version, I guess. And that's all there is to it. There's no outer, there's no God, there's no, you know, energy out there. And to me, I'm just like, really? Okay. <laughs> Pretty, uh, but yeah, my opinion is, yeah, we're probably more like receivers of consciousness, you know what I mean? Kind of get into dreams and all that stuff, you know, to what that means or like psychedelic experiences, you know, like what's going on there or yeah. even just like through breath work or whatever you can reach, you know, different higher states of consciousness, higher. So, yeah. Totally. I like to embrace the mystery, you know, it's like, I like to think about things, but ultimately I like that there's a mystery that we don't, Okay, so we were just getting uh, into like consciousness, what it means, different kind of takes on it, and yeah. and you're saying that yeah, like having that materialist kind of reductionist view of everything is is a pretty narrow way to go about it, and we we're kind of talking about that in relation to dreams too. So I'm I'm curious too. Do you ever write down your dreams? Is that are you a dream journaler? No, no, I've tried that. Um, maybe part of it's just lack of discipline, but you know, when I do remember my dreams well, I remember them very, very detailed. So it would take me probably an hour every morning to write down like every little detail of my dream, <laughs> or you know, at least 20 minutes or something. So 
Yeah. And, and I have done that in the past and I don't know if that's really done anything for me in a positive way or I've gotten anything from it. Maybe I could, I don't know. Maybe I haven't explored it deep enough, but now I think if anything, I'd probably just like voice record them, you know? Yeah. Do you, do you feel like you ever get any like ideas for, for your paintings from dreams at all? Is it- you know, I can't, I can't say that. I mean, I've heard of like, you know, there's that famous like uh, Paul McCartney, says that he came up i forget which which song it was but he had it in a dream and woke up and you know i've heard other people talk about that where they have dreamt like a whole you know concert or a book or whatever and they wake up and it's already there and they, i've never really had anything like that yeah maybe, maybe here and there but nothing that like, really sticks out that i can tell you like oh this this one thing you know right yeah so, you know. yeah it just seems kind of like the general vibe you know of of your work is somewhat dreamlike, like. Yeah, I mean, it's very based in surrealism and Dada. Um, that was probably my first real influence in the art world mm-hmm. uh, early on. You know, kind of like Dali and MC Escher were probably the two. I mean, I didn't grow up in any kind of artsy household or anything. So, right. I mean, I didn't even have art classes as a kid growing up in school like kind of astonishing honestly but because i always drew as a kid that was like a big thing to me yeah but yeah i think the first time that i actually saw paintings or drawings or anything that i was like whoa was surrealism or so i think it just made the most sense to me you know totally so yeah let's let's continue down that path with kind of your origin story like getting into drawing and, and making images how young were you when when you found kind of like maybe a i don't want to assume anything but maybe like you found a solace in making making artwork or making images i mean as long as i can remember really yeah yeah i um you know i remember as like a little kid anytime i had a you know, anyone older, like a babysitter or something, then they could draw. Like, that was just like, that was it for me. Like, oh, you know, draw me something like that. Like, and nice. well, actually, one of my first memories, I was probably say somewhere between like three and like five or something. Mm-hmm. I was being babysat and someone showed me, my babysitter showed me a picture of, it was like a woman. It's probably like a Renaissance or Baroque type painting or drawing. And I was like, oh, you know, whatever. And they're like, this is a drawing or this is artwork or whatever. And I was just moving my mind. I just, like, like, <laughs> I just thought, wow, if you could do that, you could do anything. That to me was like the ultimate, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I think just for whatever reason, like I said, I didn't grow up around artists or anything. So I wasn't even exposed to that. But... Nice. So, so you're, I'm assuming like you went, through high school like uh yeah did you go to college at all or uh i did i did do some college here and there but at the time i wasn't really there wasn't anything i really wanted to do other than art yeah and and back then i mean i I wanted to really learn like the traditional ways of art you know like drawing the figure and all that kind of stuff and at that time the only place that was really available that I knew of was like in Florence, the Academy of Florence that you could go to to still learn that stuff. Yeah. Nowadays, it's all over the place. There's been kind of a renaissance in, in art and whatnot, but back then, um, you know, talking like, you know, I graduated high school in 91. So mm-hmm. back then, the art world that we have now, it didn't exist then, you know? Yeah. Like podcasts like this did, but then it was just, it wasn't. Oh, yeah. Thing, so. yeah. Yeah, everything's, everything's changed so fast. Like te- technology has gone straight, you know, like whatever J curve asymptotic. Yeah. It's pretty impressive, honestly. Yeah. Um, just the exponential growth and skill and just everything. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot easier to, to learn and, and sort of learn by proxy with like mm-hmm. how connected everything is nowadays. So when you were, when you were growing up, um, where, where did you grow up by the way? Um, San Francisco Bay area. Okay. Yeah, I was born in Santa Cruz and then we moved to, uh, Southern Oregon 
up in the hills outside of Ashland for a few years. Um, and then my parents split up and I was like three or four. My dad moved back to Santa Cruz and then my mom and I moved just south of San Francisco and I lived there for most of my childhood. And then uh, eighth grade, I moved down to LA, Hermosa Beach and lived down there for a number of years. And then kind of all over the place. And then I ended up living in San Francisco for like 16 years. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh, Did from like 98 on. Oh, cool. Did you, so like when you were growing up, I know a lot of, a lot of artists feel this way. Did you feel like the weird kid growing up? Yeah. Um, not necessarily weird, but I definitely felt like kind of an outcast or maybe like a, yeah. And I think some of that had to do with being an only child. And also I moved a lot, you know, so yeah. I didn't really have those, you know, I felt like a lot of the kids kind of grew up together and went to all the different schools together. And I was kind of like the, the loner outcast. And, you know, I made some friends and stuff, obviously, but it was always kind of tough that way. So I think in that sense, I did for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so you're in the Bay Area, 98. Um, are you just, what are you doing at that point? Are you a full-time artist already? Are you working like side jobs? How are you, how are you getting by? Yeah, I was working, I worked in cafes and restaurants a lot. Mm -hmm. um, did a lot of, a lot of different stuff. I did some construction at some point, some, some landscaping, various things like that. Uh, yeah, a lot of cafes and restaurants. Um, and then in 1997, I met this guy, Peter McWilliams, who was an author and he owned his own publishing company. He was a friend of one of my best friends. And, you know, he saw my art and, you know, really liked it and believed in me and was going to help me go to school. He was really wealthy and uh, he's, he's since passed. But anyways, he's going to help me go to art school or whatever because I couldn't really afford it. And, yeah. And then we were talking and, like, but what I would really like to do is go to Europe and travel around Europe and actually see all this stuff, you know? Yeah. And so he helped, he like sponsored me and, you know, I did some work for him while I was over there. I took video and photos and stuff for his stock collection and whatnot. So, uh, but yeah, so that was an amazing opportunity. I was going to go for like three or four months and ended up being in Europe for like 15 months. Oh, awesome traveling around i had a girlfriend in germany for a while so i would stay with her and i'd go travel a bit and then, you know work at hostels here and there and stuff for food and stuff so that was kind of my art school i would say in a lot of ways just visiting pretty much every major museum in western europe mm -hmm. and eastern europe and just like actually like seeing this shit like in front of you it's, it's like, yeah so, so that was pretty uh that seems like almost like the best classroom, honestly. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I did apply for art school when I got back and I, I got rejected because my art was too, I kind of was kind of weird. Anyways, he said my art was too illustrative for their, for their school or whatever. <laughs> and then I talked to someone a little bit later and they saw my work and they worked there and they're like, oh, oh, I could get you, man. And I was like, you know what? Fuck that. Like, <sighs> I don't like, I don't like that the world works that way, you know, that like, oh, you know someone so you can get in whether or not your work is good or not. It's like, mm, I'm good. I'm already making art. I've been making art. I'm going to continue to make art. So, yeah. Kind of there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of nepotism either. Uh, but, I mean, I guess that's sort of the. Yeah, it makes sense in some ways, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Help your friends and family. Right. I love my friends and family. Um, but you know, you gotta be honest with people too, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, so you spent 15 months in Europe. Um, by the way, what was your, like, did you have like a favorite city in Europe that you went to? Um, at that time I would say Prague was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really liked Amsterdam. I didn't think I would like Amsterdam. I thought 
you know, it's just going to be like cash bars and red lights, which of course was there, but it was just so cool, man. Like I went there like four times actually just through my travels. Um, just the fact that it's real small, it's all in rings and you have the little canals and you yeah. get a bike and you just go everywhere. And I had started DJing at the time too. So I started buying some records and there was all these little cafes and places, clothing shops that had turntables. And so they would let me play in there. So that was amazing. Yeah, so I had a good time there. It was just nice. very uh, artsy. And, and also, people, a lot of people speak English there. And after you travel in a lot of places where people don't speak English very much, it's, it is kind of nice to be able to speak a little bit to people. For sure, yeah. Yeah, I've actually, I've actually been to Amsterdam and several places in Europe. I went in 2008. And d- definitely Amsterdam was one of my favorite spots we only stayed there for a few days but saw the like van gogh museum yeah yeah it's crazy right to see all that stuff in person it's so wild yeah barcelona or barcelona excuse me that's <laughs> pretty amazing too i really love it it's, it's kind of gotten gentrified in a lot of the areas now but it's uh it's kind of gritty i don't know i feel like barcelona um yeah i i went to madrid that was that's the one city i haven't been to yeah we went to the prado there this was before i even like made art but i i remember seeing um garden bursting delights yes (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's the one that's the one painting out of all the paintings in the world that i want to see more than any painting and i haven't seen it yet yeah (laughs) it's insane it's like they had like just a whole room for it. And then and then um that one painting, um, Las Maninas, I think it's is it Vasquez? Yeah. And it's like him painting the painting while yeah, it's like Yeah, with the king and queen in the mirror in the back. Yeah. The girls. Yes. Yeah. Super How sweet. How big is that? Sounds it was pretty sense. huge. Um, I mean I wanna I mean it's bigger than like a human. I think if I'm remembering correctly, it's been time's been weird lately, but it's been 13 years since I've been there. So, um, yeah. Or, or like maybe that I just, yeah, maybe that I never went there at all. Who knows? You know? Uh, um, but yeah, the, uh, so I want to get back to kind of like you're coming back from Europe right you're you're still in the bay area i'm uh, yeah must be at this point um well when i came back from europe i lent because i was living in la for a few years at that point mm -hmm. in the hollywood area or la like around the edge of hollywood yeah um and so my friend who held me there there so when i came back from europe i came back and worked for him for his publishing company for a little bit and then i had met this girl in rome at the vatican museum and she's Australian and she was traveling all over. She's like, Hey, I'm coming to California. I'm going to San Francisco. I was like, wait, you're not going to come visit me. And she's like, all right, but only for like a week. I don't really want to be in LA. I was like, okay. And then within that week I decided, I'm like, I'm going with you. I'm going to San Francisco. Nice. And so I had one friend there. And, uh, so yeah, I just packed up a small truck and a bunch of stuff and went to San Francisco. Sweet. So w- w- do you remember kind of like the time period or maybe it was like even a moment where you went from, uh, and maybe it hasn't even happened yet, but you went from like doing like side jobs and stuff to just living off of your art. Yeah. Um, well, when I was in Europe for my 25th birthday, uh, I was at my girlfriend's in Germany and, my 25th birthday was coming up and I was like, you know, as we all know, when you're 25, you feel like, Oh, I should be doing something or what the, you know, right. And people have been telling me, you know, for years, like, Oh, you should do something with your art. And I wasn't really painting then. I, I tried some painting, but I was mostly doing that. people were just, you know, um, you know, kept saying like, Oh, you should do something with your art. You should sell each other. So eventually I was like, okay, maybe I'll give this art thing a try. I mean, that's what I love to do. So. Yeah. 
So, so anyways, I went to Paris for the first time on my 25th birthday and climbed the Eiffel Tower and went and saw the Mona Lisa like, on my birthday and kind of like gave myself this little, you know, initiation into being an artist, you know, yeah, going to, going to Paris, you know. And so from that point on, I think I got a little commission from a friend in Germany. She wanted me to do this thing for her boyfriend. And then when I moved back to San Francisco, um, I just kind of like jumped in. I was like, okay, how do I show my art, you know? And so I put together, I was working at a cafe at the time. And I would work the early morning shift so I could get better tips and just have the afternoons and nights off. And so I would come home from work, probably all jacked up on coffee still, and I would like chill for an hour or something. And then I would paint for, you know, three, four, five hours. Uh, and I did that for a couple months until I built up a small body of work. And it was kind of like all over the place. I was like, I still experiment a lot, but I was really experimenting then. And so once I got that, then I started trying to figure out where I could show my work. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I was just starting and didn't know anything, I, you know, there were some cafes that showed work. And then there was this gallery where you actually would like rent art. You know, it's like a co-op and you had to like rent wall space and whatever. So that was actually my first show. I like rented wall space in this gallery. Still there actually. Um, and yeah, I sold a piece on the opening night for $444. That was in 99. And I was like, wow, okay, well, I guess that works, you know? So I just kept doing it and I start showing, yeah, cafes and then like all these little galleries were popping up. A lot of them that don't exist. This is kind of pre, you know, juxtapose, like high fructose, I don't think even existed then. Juxtapose existed, but like not too many people knew about it. I mean, the internet art scene wasn't, you know, right. nothing was really going on, but it was just starting. Um, it was kind of an underground art scene, so. Yeah, to start meeting people, get shows. Yeah, so would you say? I mean, so you lived like kind of pre. You do, you were an artist, like fully an artist, like before the sort of wave of social media and oh, yeah. deviant yeah. art, and yeah, you know, even um, even just MySpace. like having your yeah MySpace and having your own website and things like this were you just were you just getting photos of your work and sort of showing up at galleries and being like like hey check it out or yeah, how did that bit. work yeah a little bit um you know back then so it was just kind of like this burgeoning art scene still like it's kind of more underground you know where people were influenced by graffiti and you know skate and surf culture and and different things like that. It was still pretty fringe, you know, now it's like whatever, super accepted, but back then it was still, you know, like the old guard of like the, the bigger blue chip galleries and whatever. I mean, that was kind of like what everyone was aspiring to get to because that's all it really was. Mm -hmm. And some other smaller galleries started popping up and um, the scene in San Francisco was really small, you know? So you kind of got to know, you know, within a year you would know pretty much all the people in, in this little underground scene mm -hmm. and so we all just kind of stuck together and invited each other into shows and there'd be little pop-up galleries and things like that so it's kind of just like word of mouth and seeing stuff I mean there was a couple of times where maybe I went to a gallery and like showed some pictures I mean back then if you if you want to show your work to like a more high-end gallery you had to have slides actual slides oh wow work. Yeah. yeah I don't I don't know why but it was a thing like to project them and see about I don't know yeah so that was a thing so you had to like do this whole slide thing it was just like uh so it seems like a lot just, yeah just kind of was just like eh, i'm good with that yeah i mean i tried to do it a little bit here and there but it was just kind of a pain in the ass so right but yeah just kind of word of mouth and just getting to know people in the scene and like i said it was such a small scene that it was it was easy to, were you still djing back then too when you got back yeah Oh yeah. Yeah. I started, I started collecting records in like 96 or something. And then I think 98 was the first time I actually had my own turntables. And then, yeah, I started, uh, the guy that I first moved in with in San Francisco is a good friend of mine. He had turntables. And so we just 
they didn't start throwing house parties and then it started playing more house parties. Nice. More under more underground stuff, you know. I mean I played some clubs and stuff over the years, but it's kind of like so much of my singing, I prefer underground stuff. But. Yeah. Would you say that helped you kind of like get the paintings out there too? Like meeting people through the music? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because a lot of times too, I mean, um, and it's pretty, it's pretty common now, but back then it was just kind of a, a scene, probably like around 90 or 90, 2004, I would say. Um, started being a lot of events with live painting and stuff like that, you know, mm-hmm. like, People would have warehouse spaces and have like DJs and maybe live music too, and then like have live painting. It's kind of started at least in San Francisco right around that time. So yeah, sometimes I would get to DJ and paint or bring painting. You know what I mean? So a lot of that scene kind of like crossed over a lot then. So I know a few other DJs who are also really good artists too. So it's kind of an interesting little mix there. Nice. What were you spinning back then? Um, mostly house, techno, some drum and bass, and trip hop. It's pretty much stuff. Some there, my buddy did this thing um, called "So You Think You Can Paint," and he would, you know, a couple different spots, but this one uh, club six in San Francisco, and he would put up panels like all around this huge room, and just have paint and brushes and whatever. And I used to DJ that for him, and I would play all kinds of everything from like you know eighties hip hop and metal to you know folk stuff it was all over the place and that was fun too you know, just nice playing your favorite music that has nothing to do with dancing you know? <laughs> yeah while people paint on yeah. these walls yeah. Yeah. That's, that's rad um so i kind of this isn't a total pivot but i know that a lot of people listening will be interested in this and, and i am too um I'm curious about the origins of Further and how you guys all met and what that was like. Yeah, well, that was also part of that small scene in San Francisco. Um, I met Mario, Mars One, um, mm-hmm. and Damon Soul and David Chili, um separately, but kind of around the same time. Uh, probably around like 99 ish or something like that. And um, yeah, I don't know, like Mario and I had a show together and then we traded pieces after that show. And then he invited me to be in like, we did a couple like two person shows, like a little these little places. And, and, uh, and then Damon, I invite, I was actually curating the show and I had seen his work and I had invited him to be in the show. And then David Lee, he used to hang artwork in this cafe that my good friend worked in. So I met him there. And then David Lee, um, you know, he's from Korea and he had Mm -hmm. gone to Korea and found a a book publisher there and like a printer or whatever Mm -hmm. and made his own book. Um, (laughs) Nice. God made dirt. And uh, so he, Shortly after that, he wanted to make another book, and he approached me and said, "Hey, I want to make another book with, with like a few artists. Do you want to be in?" I said, "Yeah, that'd be amazing." And uh, he's like, "Yeah, I also talked to Mario. Mark I was referred to him as Mars from now on. So people know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> yeah, I already talked to Mars about it. He's into it too. And then so then we were trying to figure out who else, you know. And then we we're like, Damon. Damon's like, you know, and I didn't really know Damon that well at that point, but." His work was just always really good. He was doing a lot more of the robot stuff at that point. And mm-hmm. So he was just kind of like the initial thing. So that was kind of like the first, the seed of it. I would say David bringing us together to do a book. So we did four words, and then a few years later, we did Convergence, which we brought in Oliver, New York, and right in that one. Yeah, it was in that one. And then. Um, <clears throat> few years after that we did further the further book so that was kind of the seed of it all yeah we also did we also did um there was this thing that ended up being called the the gestalt collective um there was this artist apex well it's a group she writer apex ricardo Mm Ricci, and he kind of like got this group together and we started doing like big collaborative murals 
at different places. This was also probably around 2004 or something. Yeah. Probably inspired by Barnstormers. Do you know who they were? No, no. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people do, which is unfortunate, but Barnstormers started on the East Coast. Um, it was like, you know, Doze Green and David Ellis. I know Squirm. Doze. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Do- yeah Doze is there. Geez. Um, but yeah, Maya Hayek and a lot of different people would kind of come in and out of Barnstormers. But I think originally what they did was they went from New York or somewhere and drove down the East Coast and like hit up barns along the way and just completely covered these barns and these big collaborative murals. And so, and then they started doing live painting events. And then there was another group called Heavyweight, I believe. And I think they were from Canada, but they were like these two groups that were kind of like, doing these big, large collaborative things. And I think that was like, definitely inspired us. And uh, and so we started doing that stuff, yeah, like around 2004 in different galleries and stuff. And then it kind of culminated into the show at uh, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, which is a museum in San Francisco. We did this big 65 foot wall with this Bay Area now show they did every four years with the local artists there. And, uh, and Mars and a couple of people weren't involved in Max. There was some weird stuff going on and so it kind of dissolved after that. It's kind of unfortunate, but, and then, so skip forward a few years and then uh, Brian Chambers, who's a big and does Chambers project and stuff now, he, uh, you know, discovered Mar- Mars's work. Um, I think he was live painting at some show. I forget, anyways, he found Mars and loved his work and then start seeing everyone else and so he started commissioning pieces um, i think the first one they did was maybe it's symbiosis or something i think it was mars david and oliver or damon i don't know the three of them used to do stuff mm-hmm. mars oliver and damon for the most part he would have them do stuff and uh that's kind of where f- the further collective kind of came out of I mean, yeah obviously the name comes from the book Well, yeah, so that's kind of loosely like how it like uh, and then Paul Henning as well, who you know, was near his gallery and stuff. He would start commissioning some of them as well. And so nice. Kind of, we started making these big collaborative pieces together, just the five of us, you know. Right. So, you know, in my experience with collaborating, it can sometimes, you know, it can kind of go one of two ways. Like when you guys first started, um, first started to collaborate together, was it, was it just seamless or were there like, you know, what was that like? I guess it's kind of like the question, um, did you all have like lots of conversations or was it just sort of like you knew each other's work so well or. Yeah, I think that was probably it. I mean, I always equate it to like a jazz band. It's like everyone in the band is you know, to a certain level of skill or whatever. So we all, you know, we have confidence in what people can do. And sometimes you're like, do something and you're like, oh, hey, so-and-so, can you do that? You know, one of those things like right over there, you know, so you kind of talk that way. But there was definitely some, like in the early ones, how I was saying we were doing the stuff in galleries, you know, before the further collective actually existed. Yeah. Um, you know, there were some times when people would come in and like paint some shit like over something that you just painted and then they would leave and not come back for two days and you're like, hey, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> are you going to finish that? Or like, am I supposed to like, what's going Like, you know, so there's definitely a bunch of weird shit like that. But once the more of like the further thing started, um, we all knew each other for so long. It, it kind of, we didn't really talk about it a lot. I mean, right. we do now sometimes we'll like step back especially once we're in there for like a day or two and like starts to get more like a chess game yeah we'll talk to each other about stuff and oh something needs to go there whatever but but we don't really plan it out just go for sure i mean for me like a lot of times i would just i don't know you know because we always joke like mario is like the lead singer in (laughs) mars one you know and and Oliver is like the, you know, the lead guitarist, and, you know, they're just like, you know, put very iconic things in there. And yeah. there was moments early on when I would just kind of set back and 
just go in and do drop shadows and like you know do little shadows and things and just like make stuff pop out more and you wouldn't even necessarily know anything that i did in there so there's all kinds of different ways to approach it um, yeah you're kind of like the the drummer you know or like the percussion yeah you're like just yeah. tying everything all together yeah sometimes yeah bass player drummer yeah something like that yeah yeah i just i i always approach it as okay if this was my painting and all although there's these other people working on it like i'm just i'm just working for the the best outcome for the whole painting like i'm right. not thinking about like oh that's their part and that's my part that's not even a thought and i think a lot of it too just kind of growing up in graffiti culture and you know burnt in as well <clears throat> is a part of that but just the impermanence of things yeah um you know if you if you do a Back in the day in graffiti, even now, like you do street art or something, you do a mural. As soon as you walk away from that, anything can happen to it. So right. You have to let go of that somehow in your mind, you know. And same with like selling work. At some point, you have to learn to like let go and like let it go out in the world or whatever happens to happen. So mm -hmm. I think part of that, you know, burning down as well, like the impermanence of things, you know, a lot of stuff just gets people all these amazing things and they burn it. So just kind of embracing that impermanence to things and yeah yeah just kind of take, taking your ego out of it you know right it's more like more about what the painting needs not what you exactly. are trying to impose on it right exactly yeah awesome well yeah yeah i was just curious about that because i mean you know i saw you guys at oregon eclipse for yeah, sweet four years ago really That's awesome fun. love that one um and it just seems like, you know, at this point, y'all have known each other for, what, 20, 22, 23 years or something like that? Yeah, if you met. Yeah. So, came along a few years later, but, you know. Yeah. So it just seemed like, yeah, it was just like a, it was sort of like watching like a, a good, you know, Grateful Dead show or something where like, right. it's like, ah, oh, they're really jamming, you know, and, um, so yeah, I was just curious about how that all came to be and, and whether or not there was like a lot of like planning, not planning of the paintings, but like conversations or like, you know. Yeah, not too much. It's, it's kind of funny. You know, I always wanted to be part of some, you know, like the surrealist or like this group and then, you know, these different groups in art history, you know, it's like, oh, I want to be part of that. And I guess we kind of are in some way, but I always pictured it more like we, you know, sit down and philosophize about things, talk about it, but we don't really, you know. It's like, yeah, yeah. Sometimes we do. Damon and I do, and Mario and I do quite a bit of good conversations, but it's it's not like how I, it's not how I thought it would be, in that sense. Um, yeah, I think there's been a couple times where we're like, okay, that last painting was, you know, lots of blue or something. Maybe this time, like there's one painting we did. I think one of the ones at Burning Man, and it was. And the third one all five of us did together and it was mostly just grayscale and then so we were like okay let's keep this one grayscale and we'll slowly introduce some color at the end or whatever so once in a while that'll happen here. nice yeah well yeah it just seems like y'all know each other so well and n no like no one has too big of an ego or anything so that it it just it works really well yeah um, I mean, we're, we're always like fucking with each other too that's like a similar thing you know Oh yeah, you got to keep it fun. Kind of getting cocky or something, we'll just like bust their balls or something. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, yeah. So um, I kind of want to like pivot to like the like your work in particular, um, and like maybe some processes and uh, and routines you have with it. Um, what do you do if anything before you start painting? Uh, is there like a ritual or, or like habits you you have to get yourself in to the mind, like a creative flow space, flow state? Mm. I would say not really. Um, I, there's a lot of incubation periods. I've never been someone who you know treats this like a nine to five job. I mean, there's some artists that do, and you know, obviously it works for them really well. Um, yeah, it's funny. Early on, I used to, before I kind of really took on the art thing, I, I would, you know, get really inspired by something and I would just like 
form and like make this drawing and I would spend like five or six hours or whatever it was. This was before I was painting and I would come out and I was like, wow, that's actually pretty good. And then it would be like months, you know, would go by before I would do something else again. And then that one, I'd put all this energy into it. And then at some point, you know, I'm like, well, maybe I need to be a little more consistent, like paint every day or draw every day or whatever. And I've tried that too. But then there's times where it's just like my heart is not into it. My, I'm not inspired and I'm just kind of going through the motions. And there's definitely something to be said about that. I mean, you're still learning the skills or whatever. But yeah. But I, I noticed that there was still this, like, if I make a piece and I put all my energy into it and then a month or two goes by and I don't do any art at all, and then I do that again at that point because I got inspired. It's the same for me as if I put all my energy into that and then I keep painting and drawing every day for a month or whatever. Yeah. Just kind of half-hearted because I'm not quite inspired or whatever. And then boom, I get to that. So it's kind of this weird, like, yeah. So I definitely need times where, you know, a week or two at the minimum sometimes where I'm just taking in information, listening to podcasts, reading about things. Nothing to do with art, you know? Yeah. I've gotten really, I've gotten really into mushrooms in the last few years. <laughs> so studying something like that or music production or just, I'll just go somewhere completely different. Yeah. Creative as well sometimes, but. Yeah. So I don't really have any like specific rituals. It's just more uh, just really allowing myself those incubation periods, you know? Nice. Uh, some of the paintings, obviously, the more like tripped out abstract ones or whatever, those are just kind of painting, I'm just kind of experimenting to see what happens. And then other times I'll have a very specific idea, like the paintings that few have done with the you know someone looking at their phone and their heads all glitched out yeah that was a very specific idea that i had and there's another one i did with the you know the iphone with the you know, handcuff. Handcuff, yeah. handcuff coming off of it you know it's like those were very specific ideas and so i'll do research you know i'll maybe take photos or like research what that actually looks like or make drawings first I yeah usually don't sketch before i paint i just paint um, but yeah certain ones like that i will nice i want to share the screen a little bit um just so that people who are watching on the patreon can like just get an idea of like what we were just <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah so let's see we'll go to your your instagram oh nice awesome there's there we go. there's the uh dude so the first time i saw this big props on this one i thought that i thought that you had just painted a phone like a phone screen yeah and like somehow put a handcuff on there and then you know i looked at it for you know 10 seconds more and realized oh it's just a really realistic handcuff and phone yeah um how do you feel about i mean it's it's pretty obvious like how you kind of are looking at social media based on like, like something like this or these glitched out paintings of, of people looking at their phone, but like maybe go into that a little bit. It's, it's something that I tend to talk about on the show a lot because I think it's, it's this ins sort of like insidious thing that, you know, it'll be, if there is a history to be talked about in a hundred years, it will, will definitely be like almost like a conquest or something like that. Mm -hmm. of, of a conquest in which, in which way? Sorry, I couldn't hear you there. A, a conquest in which way? What are you thinking? Uh, like, maybe that's not the right word, <clears throat> but, um, like this, who's conquest? I mean, that's the, maybe it's the conquest of the AI or just like a whole new, it's like a whole yeah. new world has come into, to being and we're not even really that aware of it. We're just kind of out here chasing clout, I guess. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. And we have no idea what the, you know, no one ever wants to talk about, you know, what the radiation can do to you or things like this. I mean, there's, you know, lots of studies and documentaries done about, you know, 
cancer from cell phones and shit like that. But no one ever, you know, all that gets suppressed, of course. So there's that aspect to it. But these paintings in particular, um, they kind of stem from also how I felt feel about television. I haven't really watched television or owned a television in like 25 years or something. Nice. Um, and just my initial thought with television, or at least one of them was, well, people would always say like, you know, I'd say something about television. People are like, oh, well, I only watch, you know, the nature shows or whatever. And mm-hmm. and then I started thinking about that. And I'm like, well, even that, even that, I mean, sure, maybe you're getting some education, but basically you're still, it's still a media where someone is telling you what's going on. Like you're still consuming it. Right. I mean, you have these people out, these scientists or whatever, and they're out studying lions, let's say out in the Serengeti and, they're saying, oh, the lions do this and the lions do that and blah, blah, blah. And here's the lions doing this and here, you know. But that is worlds apart from you actually being in the Serengeti yourself and smelling the zebra shit and the warmth <laughs> of the breeze and hearing the sound. It's just completely different. I mean, you could study the Eiffel Tower in books for all your life, but until you stand underneath the Eiffel Tower and climb the Eiffel Tower and see what's around it and hear people speaking French and whatever languages you really don't have any idea about it. So anyways, that was kind of the initial thing. So these cell phone ones, it's basically that. It's like, you know, I made it so that the hand and the phone are, you know, pretty realistic. So that's like reality or our reality. I don't really know if it's reality before, like you're saying, this technology can start taking over. And then the whole glitching out part is like, there's this whole new world that lives inside the phone, inside the television. You know, it's like the, this whole universe in there. Yeah. And it's part of the same world because it's referring to things that are in this world that you can actually go and see for the most part. But it's not. It's completely different too. And your brain doesn't know the difference. Like they've done studies where That's you right. see an elephant with your eyes, and then you close your all right, so think of that elephant and you know, that elephant, you know, the same areas light up in your brain and whatnot. So and they've done studies with that with television too. It's like they all this information is, is flooding into you and your brain isn't going like, oh, that's real, that's not real. This is it's all the same. So I just feel like everyone's fucking consciousness is just getting all glitched out with this whole, you know. So that's kind of not going like super deep into it. So yeah. Like, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I, I, uh, I just sort of wanted to get a, a, a visual to go along with that. And I could definitely, yeah, sorry. I, I kind of go off on tangents a bit. No, I can, <laughs> I, I was going to say I could go off on, on the whole social media aspect of it too. It's just like, I don't know. It's, it's one of those things where I am grateful because I get to, you know, I get to sort of share my work with any number of random people throughout the world. And I'm not so sure that I would have an art career without social media, but at the same time, I see like all the deleterious effects that it's doing to society. I mean, first and foremost, like the whole privacy issue about how all these companies collect your data, you know, from Google to Facebook to Amazon, all these, you know, obviously mega corporations. And then they, I'm sure, did you see, I know you don't watch television, but there's a, there's a documentary called the social dilemma. Did you catch that? that, You did such a watch films and yeah, I watch TV show once in a while or something like a series of Twin Peaks or something. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Are you a big David Lynch fan? Sorry, I can't hear you. I am a David Lynch fan, yeah. Okay, nice, nice. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I fall into uh, murmuring or something, just snap at me. I'll do, I'll do one of these. Perfect. Cool. Um, what's your favorite David Lynch movie? Uh, my favorite David Lynch film... I would say it's probably Dune actually, which is funny because that's really? the one that he re- he renounces and he and he doesn't uh, he doesn't acknowledge it. Like he he I don't think he even puts it in like, its filmography, you know. Yeah. But 
I love the story. My daughter's middle name is actually Dune. So nice. Um, just, I love Dune. I love the visuals in that movie. I mean, there's definitely some like cheesy kind of campy parts. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if it's like his greatest work, but I just, the sci-fi, just everything about that. I, I really love it. Um, but other than that, I would probably say maybe Mulholland Drive. Yeah. Yeah. That'd have to be mine watch. too. Yeah, I'm just trying to like figure that one out. I actually watched uh, this guy on YouTube did like a whole breakdown of that movie, like for an hour, and it was like, wow, like there's some crazy shit in that movie. Oh yeah. That I mean, some of it obviously. You talk to David Lynch, you see interviews with him, and he's just like all very surreal about the whole thing. Like I don't know, like this thing just came to me, and I don't know what that means. But there's also a lot of actual symbolism that he's using. Yeah. Do you feel like that in in painting sometimes where you're you make something a thing that you can't maybe language, but that then someone else will come along and be like, wow, this is, this is what this means to me. And you're like, Oh, I guess I would sort of channel. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. It happens a lot actually. It's interesting. Yeah. What's the most memorable reaction you've gotten from someone, maybe at a festival or, or in a gallery or something? No, my favorite one though at festivals is you know you're sitting there painting something and someone comes up to you and they're like are you painting that and you're like no <laughs> dude that one always that's happened a couple times I'm just i swear to god like these <laughs> these tropes are so funny because like no matter how much we talk about them they still keep happening you know like right i painted at my I'm, you know, it was like a one day festival in Denver, but it was my first festival back since COVID or whatever. And there, you know, line of painters, various different styles and I'm painting and this girl comes up and she's real enthusiastic and just like really stoked. So I didn't want to be mean, but she goes, did you paint all these, you know? <laughs> and I'm just like, no, nope, just this one. Have a lovely night, you know? But I don't know. It's just, it's like that. And, um, yeah. Are you, are you painting that right now? Those are just classic ones. I don't know. I think, yeah. I think I've joked about that on the show plenty of times, but it just, it still tickles me to this day. It's like classic. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, sometimes I, I think kind of what you were saying before, I, I can't think of any like specific reactions I've had. Um, but yeah, that that's always been a good one for me is when I do paint something that's just kind of very kind of my subconscious or whatever it is, not really thinking about it too much. And then somebody will come and say, oh, what is this and that? And they'll like put this whole story together with all this stuff. And oh my God, I just saw the you know, That's always like. Do you, do you do that with your paintings? Do you kind of put a story together as you're creating them? Sometimes, yeah. Like there's a, piece for instance talking about david lynch there's a, a piece of mine called the blue room and it's it's mostly blue with a woman standing against the wall and this kind of crazy creature with these red curtains and i actually named it excerpts from blue room excerpts from the black lodge which is you know, from reference to twin, twin peaks. peaks yeah but that was kind of after like I didn't start that painting thinking that it just kind of like, Oh, these curtains and this weird thing in this room. And it just reminded me of black lodge. And so that, sometimes things like that would just kind of like come together on their own. You know? For sure. Yeah. And that, by the way, that final scene in the first version of twin peaks where everything's like going backwards and yeah, that's gave me chills. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, I, would you say that your style has evolved over time and if so, how so? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've definitely gotten better at painting um, <laughs> sure. style wise. Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, honestly, I don't really, I don't really look at my work a whole lot. I mean, as far as contemplating it or like really 
going back and looking at my stuff. We had to do once in a while just to like, oh, wow, I was doing that back then. That's pretty cool. I should maybe explore that more. But I don't really, I've always kind of been more of like make it and just keep going, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. I, I think asking someone else who enjoys my work maybe that has seen my work over the years, they might be a better person to ask about that, honestly. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that um, makes sense. Yeah. Um, would you say that like being an artist or being in the <clears throat> art world has has changed you, or like what have you what have you learned about yourself through painting? Maybe is a better question. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel like painting pretty much any creative thing, and it could be even carpentry or whatever it is like when you when you're really getting into the zone of it and you know it kind of becomes like a therapy in a lot of ways and i don't know like you can just work through so many things and you can learn so many things through the act of painting or making music or whatever it is right dance that somehow relate to things in your other aspects of your life so you know, I can't say specific things. Maybe I would say one of the things I've really learned through painting um, is to push through when it seems, you know, just like really getting into the process of painting instead of the outcome of the painting. Mm -hmm. But I always feel like in the majority of my paintings, unless it's a very specific thing, but a lot of times I'll start out feels really good whatever and then you get kind of get to this weird midpoint or like whatever yeah and you're just like oh uh, like you know and you just kind of get bummed about it even just like uh. but if you can push through that there's always gold on the other end mm -hmm. not always but for me that's been the experience for the most part and i feel like that's it's such a reflection of life you know it's just like like with relationships let's say you know like a good friend or a partner or whatever it's like everything's all beautiful at first and then you kind of get to these like areas and it's like well can we work through this and like try and work through it the best you can and, like really be conscious about it and that i mean at least in relationships that's when you get to the gold right it's like what can you absolutely so i would i would say that's one thing that i've really kind of learned through painting that's very distinct for me in my mind yeah There's I... probably plenty others but yeah nice thanks for pulling that out I, I definitely agree that that mid it's kind of I almost equate it to like uh, growing up, you know, like childhood is usually like pretty fun and you're carefree and then you hit puberty and you're like, what's this? Right. But then you kind of like, you know, you grow up a little bit, you get into your 20s, you get into your 30s. Life gets a little bit, hopefully, a little bit easier the more you live it and the more you have some experience under your belt and know, you know, what moves to make and when to listen to your intuition, things like that. Right. Yeah. Um, so I know we talked about David Lynch already, but I'm also curious as to anyone or any, any other books, movies, anything like that outside of painting music, that that has influenced you or inspired you i mean it's honestly just endless yeah I, when you, you sent me that question you know and yeah and uh i was thinking about that and I'm like there's so many so much that i wish i could really pinpoint some i mean there are some like um alejandro hodorowski who made was also going to make Dune. I don't know if you saw that yes. documentary. Yeah. Which would have been the most epic fucking thing ever. Right. Um, but like the Holy Mountain, I don't know if you've seen that film. I have, yeah. Pretty pretty awesome. Pretty weird. Yeah. Surreal. Just like the ending to that. It's like kind of the best or one of the best endings of the film ever. But um, so things like that are like, I remember at one point, like, I wanted to be able to, like, make painting, like, Bjork makes music, you know? Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't like everything Bjork does, but she's, to me, she's a true artist. She's, like, constantly reinventing herself and just always doing yes. some shit, and, like, just amazing, man. Like, 
yeah, some of her stuff I don't care for at all. But right. Um, so there's people like that, you know, like to me, like true artists. It doesn't even matter what you do. I mean, Bruce Lee was kind of a big um, mentor. Maybe I've never really. I've always kind of wanted a mentor, but I never really had one. But mm -hmm. so people like that that you can kind of like look up to and. Yeah, maybe they do something cool, but they also have like a really interesting way of, you know, seeing, seeing the world and philosophizing about things, you know? Yeah. That's always really interesting to me. So, yeah, there's a lot of people that I could point to music. I mean, so much music. I mean, it's just endless. I mean, I'm, For sure. I'm so into so many different, you know, Future Sound of London maybe is one. Early oh, album. nice. Like their early albums, like the album uh, Dead Cities. Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as an album goes, like listen to that from beginning to end. It's like, it's a masterpiece. For you know, sure. Dark Side of the Moon or something like that, you know, just like people like that who just somehow have transcended the mundane and tapped into something magical, you know. It's like when you see those paintings or you hear that music and you're like, you can't tell what that is. Right but it's that thing, whatever that thing is, that's it. They got it. They tapped into it and there it is. And it rarely happens, but so, yeah, yeah whoever, it's like, whoever, whoever can do that just inspires me somehow. Yeah. You, you mentioned Bjork and constantly reinventing herself. And I always think of like David Bowie kind of in the, in the same vein. Yeah. Another one. Exactly. Yeah. He's, he was amazing. He's Are, amazing. Are you trying to, to sort of reinvent, like maybe not your style, but just like subject matter, or just explore different areas every, every few few years? Is that something you're consciously trying to do, or are you just, um, are you just open to to whatever comes through? Um, yeah, I would say a bit of both. Mm -hmm. Um. I've never been, you know, there's so many artists, especially nowadays that just kind of, you know, dare I say cookie cutter art, but it's like they find a formula that works and they just, you know, and, you know, part of that is, you know, the pressure from the market, the gallery system, you know, it's like, oh, you For have sure. to create something that, you know, people will recognize and they'll recognize, you know, and all that stuff. And I get that. But for me, that's like the antithesis of what art is about. Uh, yeah you know like formulas like i don't know for me art like picasso was an early influence as well mm -hmm. and he went through a lot of different styles and was constantly experimenting and and you know that's kind of the school that i come from it's just i mean sure i could i could you know and i i have worked in series but it's more over like i'll paint a painting i'll put all this energy into it and then i'm I'm fucking done with that, man. I don't want to like explore something else, you know? Yeah. And then I'll go do some other style for a while. And then I'm, maybe I'll get back to that thing a year or two later and paint another painting that would be part of that series. So I kind of work more like that, but yeah, I just, I don't want to fucking, I'm sure I would be more successful in some ways, you know, probably have more shows and be in magazines and all this stuff if I, made a very distinct style and kept that up and whatever. And, mm -hmm. you know, no, nothing against anyone that does that. It's great for them. But for me personally, that's just not how I, I work. That's fucking boring to me. You yeah. Know, it takes like the I, fun out of it. Yeah. And there's so many things to explore. I mean, obviously if you just look through my Instagram, there's so many different styles or whatever. Mm -hmm. And all of those come from a completely different mindset. It's almost like I have a, multi-personality art disorder or something, you know, it's like, it's, I wouldn't call it a disorder, but it's, yeah, just life is for me, it's about experiencing and exploring and I don't want to put any boundaries on that. For sure. Is also my art. I don't want to put any boundaries on that. I don't want to be pigeonholed like, oh, he's a visionary artist or, oh, he's a surrealist. It's like, I'll fucking paint whatever I want to fucking paint. Hell yeah. I have a vision or a thought coming through. That's what I'm going to do. I don't, I don't care. So, yeah. Nice. That, that to me, that to me is true art. Like when you're right. Just, I don't know. Art for me has always been this collaboration with spirit or the gods or 
whatever, who knows, some interdimensional beings that might be sitting right next to us right now. Who fucking knows? But yeah, yeah. when you get in that zone, like, you know, it feels like there's other forces at work, right? It's like right. something there. And for me, that's what art's always been about is stepping, you know, putting your ego aside and allowing those things to also come in, which hopefully in some ways working for the greater good or the greater positive consciousness of things. I, I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So that's always kind of been what I consider to be like true art, uh-huh. you know? Hell yeah. I'm not always there. I'm not always a true artist. Sometimes I'm just making some stupid shit, but right. if you can tap into those realms, I think that's where, that's where the real deal is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I love, love an artist who can just, you know, like David Bowie or, or like, I mean, you too, who can just be like every couple of years be like, no, I'm, I'm interested in this now. And like, yeah. like going from kind of, whatever you know surrealist kind of things you were doing before and then having just people on their cell phones like i feel like that idea was out there and like you were kind of like the first on it you know what i mean we were all sort of like coming into the awareness of like fuck we're looking at our phones like six hours a day you know unless you can be like real disciplined about it it's uh, you know my my buddy Michael Garfield says that phones are pretty much a part of our bodies now. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we plan through them, we socialize through them, we, you know, all the things that we do through them. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I just got to, I got to give you props, man. Like, that's awesome. And I'm kind of trying to do the same thing. Like, not all my work looks the same. And I haven't found something that, even though, it, some things have worked quote unquote in terms of like marketability, I guess. Like I'm always like a little like tentative to do the same thing again for too long. At I, mean, least. I mean, if that's true to you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure for some people that's, what's true for them. You know, they, Oh, hundred percent. Some idea and they just, that's what they're into. Yeah. But I think a lot of it, I would say, at least from my observation, you know, over the many years of this whole art scene kind of growing Mm -hmm. is that a lot of people just fall victim to, and, you know, by no fault of their own, but just the pressures of, yeah, the market and like, okay, if I want to be an artist, I need to like survive and, you know, I need to make something. So I get it. I get it. I mean, I've fallen victim to that too. But for me, once those pressures start to come in and influence your art, like your art is adulterated now for sure know, so I'm, I'm always trying to like you know, hammer back at that machete and I, <laughs> you know that's nice yeah so so it makes sense i see i see why people do it and and some people are probably not even conscious about it they probably just think that that's how you do it and that's what you, what you have to do and mm-hmm. i think it can be a trap you know just i don't know i think money i mean money is just an exchange for your time it's just a it's an energy whatever but I think money can just fuck up things so bad in the sense that there there'll be something pure mm-hmm. and then you know like let's say a little small art scene is popping up and then all of a sudden people that have money that aren't creative want to be part of that and support it but then they start dictating what that scene is and whatever and then it just loses the whole thing i mean i've seen it happen in the underground dance scene over and over again for years and years, just you know, people making these huge raves and all this money. And it's like, but the best part is you're like these 150 people parties in some dark warehouse where yeah. everyone's just getting loose and, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, you, you can trace it all the way back to the, the hippie movement in the 1960s or oh, yeah. kind of like any sort of like thing that starts out pure with good intentions can be sort of, here comes this word again, reconquered or reconquested by like the, the people with interests or the people with, uh, you know, trying to move, you know, something in a direction that's either more marketable or less radical or, you know, I don't know. It just happened. Like, you know, um, what's the old burning man phrase? Like it was better last year. (laughs) Yeah. 
you know um but yeah i guess it's just the world we live in i don't know it's yeah yeah everything's market driven i mean yeah i mean we're so that's a whole nother subject obviously but yeah when we really break it down we're just so separated from our basic necessities which is you know, food shelter water right i mean how many people actually grow a good portion of their own food, you know, like not right. a whole lot of us do, you know, I mean, I grew up mostly in cities and suburbs. So we're just, you know, it's like, cool. You have to go work this job that really for a lot of jobs really have nothing to do with anything except people consuming a bunch of shit that doesn't really matter so that you can get this paper to go buy this thing that you actually need. But then you have extra paper so then you buy a bunch of shit that you don't need and you're polluting it's just like this whole fucking bad. so yeah anyway. well yeah it's a lot it's a lot to think about yeah it is it is <laughs> i didn't have any questions prepped to go down this rabbit hole but i'm glad we kind of went down as as far as we did um yeah, let's not let's not go in there. Yeah, let's... yeah, this is, this is <laughs> us, ostensibly an art podcast, so I'll I'll try and keep it there. But um, well, I mean, a lot of those things influence my art. If that's any consolation, I mean, for sure, you know. for sure. Well, so. okay, kind of. This might be an adjacent question that I ask a lot that I don't think I, I sent over to you, but um, what, in your opinion, is a brutal fact? about well sorry what is just a brutal fact about the art world that people who aren't involved in it might not know about wow that's a good question well there's a few different ones i mean there's different art worlds too you know so you have like the art world the big blue chip gallery where people are selling paintings for millions of dollars mm -hmm. and then you have like more of the festival maybe visionary art world and then you have like the you know there's so many different art worlds right um i would say one thing that kind of popped into my mind there's another thing as well but one thing that really kind of popped into my mind was that people don't realize how much time that you put into a painting yeah you know like i've had people you know years ago or whatever like I would have a painting for like three hundred dollars that I, you know, maybe spent a month on or two months on, and they're like human and haunted. They're like, oh, I love this painting so much. Oh my god, I want this painting. Oh my god, this speaks to me so much. It's like three hundred dollars. It's like, a, it's like, yeah, but you're gonna go out next week and spend two hundred dollars or something on dinner and drinks with some friends, which yeah. is great, but that moment is just a moment. It's gone. You're gonna have this painting for as long as you have this painting, it's going to bring you inspiration. I mean, if you do actually love it. Right. So I think people's value systems that people that aren't artists or don't really understand that they just don't quite understand how much blood, sweat and tears people have put in. hundred you know, percent pursuing art. I mean, nowadays art is, um, you know, it's much more acceptable and it's cool and stuff, but someone like myself who has been doing it for a long time. Um, you know, there's been thousands of hours that I didn't go out and party and whatever, right. just because I was somehow needed to make this painting, you know? And so when someone says, how long did it take to make this painting? It took me 20 plus five right. years to make this painting, to get to this point, to be able to make that painting. So it's not like I just spent a month on it or a couple of days. It's, like, right. it's a lot. So I think, you know, people will pay a, a lawyer $300 an hour for a fucking signatures or whatever it is but they don't want to pay artists for what they so that that to me is one thing that i think people that don't people just don't get it and you know yeah again no fault of their own a lot in the way, so. for sure for sure um that was kind of a long-winded question for a fairly simple answer <laughs> <laughs> no it's great the more information we we put on here the better i say Okay. You, know. you know, I spend a lot of time by myself in my studio and doing stuff. So when I actually get to talk to someone about some interesting stuff, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> hell yeah, man. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's kind of the impetus for this whole podcast is like, I mean, I'm sort of trying to just, sh you know, show the contours of the art, the 
art world at large like you know i've i've had all the kind of like homies out here in colorado on and um but then like i've had other people who aren't in the scene really at all as well and i'm just trying to connect the dots and and i know that a lot of visual artists in particular don't really get to talk very much you know because I mean, when we're making our artwork, we're listening to music. We're you. We're taking in through our ears, you yep. know, whatever it is, whether it's an audio book, music, or podcast, or, or whatever. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I think it's just I think it's important to to get to get us hermits out here and like on on record, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, it's great, man. I appreciate what you're doing. It's definitely it's definitely needed, you know. Thank you. So it's so nice too. Like, you know, I listened to some of of your podcasts, you know, before this, um, you know, just to see like how how it was and stuff. And you know, some artists, obviously, that like Emily Kell, and I really always liked her work. She's I met her one time briefly, but Mm -hmm. you know, just to just to hear, it's like you see the visual art, you see the posts on Instagram of them hanging out doing stuff, but like. What do they really think? How do they really come about their work? You know, it's it's always really interesting. Sometimes it's very different than you would think, and it just makes like I didn't really like Basquiat's work. I've seen tons of it over the years. Yeah, and, you know, I'm like okay, whatever. But then there's the, that last documentary of him, and there was a lot of him in it, and just seeing how he was and talked and stuff, it just gave me a huge appreciation for his art after that exactly it's really, it's really important so yeah man you're doing, you're doing good work well i think that there's there's more to the art than just the finished product like there's like you were saying about basquiat it's more like the vibe you know like the way he's sort of carrying himself and talking and and just being you know it's it like maybe you know you didn't like his work at first but then you understand this person as a more, I guess, as a human, and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. It's like, you're kind of, you kind of just like catch the vibe that they're on. And I think, you know, with the, sorry to take it back to social media, but like <laughs> with that, it's still a text-based medium, right? Like for the most part. And I think it's important to hear people's voices and see people. And like, it's just so weird that we had that dichotomy of this brand new technology that connects nearly everyone on the world. And we're still like typing out little, little sentences and not able to, you know, if I, you know, if, if I ran the world, like everyone would be able to do this, like, and it all be a virtual kind of hangout or whatever, but I guess we're not there yet. I don't know. feels like we should be though. Or just back to fucking cafes or parks or dinner parties. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. Yeah. Even better. I, know, I, I think too, I, you know, I'm kind of that generation. It's like on the cusp between, you know, it's like when I was a kid, like that's kind of when video games started and whatever. So I got the early part of like consumer technology and whatever. But <clears throat> the whole social media thing, like you were saying, like when I first started making art, that didn't really exist yet. So yeah. I'm kind of still in that one foot in the analog world and one foot in this new world. Sure. So it's been interesting to kind of observe things from that viewpoint. My point was exactly with that, something that you were saying, but yeah, yeah, no, I get it. Like all through the, uh, by the way, how, how did you, uh, handle the whole pandemic thing? How'd that go for you? Um, hasn't really affected me i think the one way it's affected me is is seeing a lot of like friends and people that i thought were maybe a little more open-minded or aware just kind of like drinking the kool-aid and just really kind of i don't know all of a sudden trusting the government i don't, know, I don't want to get into this because you know, okay it's, cool it's, it's, it's a we big can, thing we can cut i it mean out. not that i don't want to get into it but it's just kind of like it's a whole thing. pretty much i pretty much just lived my life the exact same way i mean I remember there was all these memes early on where it was like, you know, a picture of someone that's like, you know, locked down in your house for two weeks and people are like freaking out or whatever. And then it's like underneath artists and like, Pfft. totally. And doing, and doing this shit for yeah. years. Like, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Just, yeah. 
yeah, kind of uh that's sort of exactly how I felt. I was like, oh, now everybody sort of gets to see like what my life is like, you know? And then also like, I don't, I try to live my life. It's a constant battle, but I try to live my life, you know, outside of fear, you know, trying not to base my actions and my decisions on fear. And from what I can tell, most of what everybody is doing for the last year and a half is based out of fear mm-hmm. and you just see it you know I, I i go into places without masks all the time until if someone tells me to put one on i'll put one on if i need to go in there but we're walking home depot or something without one on and no one says anything yeah i'm i i've never gotten a flu shot i haven't had the flu in over 10 years i haven't been sick in like four or five years like i take care of myself i eat a lot of mushroom like medicinal mushroom stuff i I know I'm not sick. I don't mean, asymptomatic. I mean, no, I know my. I take care of myself. Um, but people are just so afraid. Of, oh, and then I guess I will get into it for a second. But just like th- this one is just blowing my mind lately. Mm-hmm. And and no judgment on anyone who's gotten a vaccine. I have not gotten a vaccine, and I'm not going to get a vaccine. Well, it's not even a vaccine, but I'm not going to get a jab until they're holding me down and doing it to me for my own personal reasons. And whoever's gotten a vaccine, that's their own personal reasons. And Mm -hmm. both of us should have the right to do that. But if you're vaccinated and you can still get it and still spread it Mm -hmm. and you're unvaccinated and you can still get it and you can still spread it, why do I have to get vaccinated? So the, uh, the thing that I've, the better, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I get it. And I mean, if you're vaccinated, supposedly you're going to have less, you know, you're not going to go into the hospital. They say or you're not going to die from it. Your symptoms are going to be less or whatever. Right. That seems to be what they're trying to sell the vaccine on. Right. For sure. So if that's the case, if let's say I'm vaccinated and you're not vaccinated and you pass it to me, or and say you are vaccinated and you still pass it to me. Well, then if I'm vaccinated, I should be okay, right? So why does it matter if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated? Why does anyone it's like care about yourself? Like, I don't know. To me, it's just like, yeah. I mean, I, am I, I off base here? I don't know. I'd love to hear uh, your well, I'll, ju- I'll it, just try, I'll bounce something off of you. Like, uh, I definitely think that like this whole thing, you know, what's the phrase, never let a catastrophe go to waste or whatever. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, like it's definitely been like wielded in the completely wrong ways, but to get back to the, the vaccine thing, like from my understanding, like the idea at least was that like, if a certain percentage of the population got the vaccine more or less like in the first three months or something right Mm -hmm. then that would stop the virus from mutating because if it hits the vaccine wall inside of you you can still Mm -hmm. pass it on but it won't live as long and like the life of a virus you know they can while you're sick depending on how long you're sick it can spawn 20 generations and by the time you get to that 20th generation then there's like mutations and then that's why we're having all the breakthrough cases and now that's just that's i think to steel man the vaccine side of it i guess um that's i think the most legitimate argument for getting one yeah but at this point there's already apparently a mutation that's like breaking through anyway so yeah, yeah I don't mutations know. didn't even start until the vaccine started getting rolled out. So, what is, what is that? Uh, something dependent? It's like where the the vaccine somehow it mutates actually because I forget where I have some stuff in my brain about all this. But, yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely yeah, I, like I just it just doesn't it doesn't make any sense to me honestly the whole thing. But then you start to look at um, you know like right now like the whole hashtag recently natural immunity was blocked on instagram i don't know if you caught into that but yeah so it's like it's so it's like wait a minute 
natural immunity is actually better than the vaccine immunity that's scientifically proven. And, and we've known that like before COVID even came along. Um, so if you have to show a vaccine card, why can't you show an antibody test card? Yeah. And if it was really about health and that was really what was going on, you should be able to, show. so it's not about that. It's about money and control and all these different things. You follow the money, you go and look at Fauci, you look at Bill Gates, you look at all these people who are involved in this thing and who they fund, who they're being funded by, who's funding the CDC, the NA, all this stuff. So when you really start to see what's going on and then you start talking about the great reset and the, you know, the World Economic Forum at Davos and all this kind of stuff and their whole plans of making everything digital currency and just, you know, and, and we're moving really quickly what seems to be like China into a, you know, like a social credit system, you know, which is already kind of happening with this vaccine card passport thing. Yeah. So when you kind of tie all those things into it as well, it just it makes a much bigger picture of what's really going on here. At least in my mind, I know a lot of people are going to call me crazy conspiracy theorists, whatever, but I've been looking at all this shit for 20 plus years. So, you know, when you start to connect all the dots, it's pretty fucking obvious what's going on. Yeah. In my mind, in my mind, really call me crazy. It's fine. No, I mean, it's no wonder, like, the whole, I, I think even any average person, if you ask them, like, are we being lied to, like, most of the time, they would be like, 100%, <laughs> you know? And so it's, I mean, I don't know. It's no wonder all. that we wouldn't, that we, you know, it's it's not rocket science to figure out that, like, obviously we've been lied to about this whole thing as well. Like, from the beginning when, um, what's his name? Oh, yeah. Fauci was like, no, masks you know, whatever, masks don't do anything. And yeah, then, you don't need to wear masks. And then it's like, yeah, so I don't know. I I definitely, at first I was like, all right, like everybody, you know, like the first couple of weeks, people were, of course, like, you know, coming out with like very wild, like out of left field conspiracies. And then like now we're actually learning that the virus probably did come out of a lab in Wuhan. Well, duh. I yeah. mean, come on. I mean, like so even, wait a minute. There's there's yeah. this wet market that's a few <laughs> miles from a level four virology lab that's studying this thing, and it came from this like yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> but it's funny that it took um what uh John Stewart to be on like, you know, to be great. the guy. Yeah, that was that was great. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, you know, like um, virology is an art, I guess. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean bioengineering the future yeah um so in that kind of view of the world what is what is like the artist's role would you say like um i mean for me personally i can't speak for anybody else but i just need to be true to my own convictions and if i feel something is i feel i mean i don't know if you follow me on instagram or what but the last year and a half, I haven't really posted any actual posts. I mean, maybe a few, but right. I just started posting stories like memes and, and most of it and information and stuff. And most of it has been trying to get the truth out there. Like what's really going on. It's like, Oh, well, have you thought about this? And Oh, did you know this? And, and again, people can call me in crazy conspiracy theorists, but then it's like, okay, well, why are, thousands of doctors, nurses, virologists, different scientists coming forward and saying, hey, this isn't like a good thing. Like, why would they put their whole career and life on the line if it was just some like bullshit? So, yeah, I don't know. I feel like, yeah, I mean, you know, you have like Diego Rivera back in the day, you know, making murals about certain things <clears throat> or, you know, different muralists, like in Ireland, whatever, making political murals and stuff. And, you know, you have like Rage Against the Machine or different, you know, music that has been more outspoken about things in the world. And that's kind of where I come from. I mean, I feel like if you have some convictions and something that you really believe in and, and think is important for the world, then 
you should fucking speak that shit. I mean, you're going to lose friends. I lost a thousand followers over the last year and a half just from the shit I've been posting. Really? You know? Yeah. But it's like, that's cool. Whatever. I mean, I have my family and my friends and I don't have followers. I don't really care. Obviously, but <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just interesting. Like you're going to lose people that don't get it or don't agree with you. And that's sad. You know, I've, I've I've talked to so many people over the last year plus that have lost, you know, their best friends and family just because people don't want to have conversations differing of differing opinions and still accept and love each other. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think it's really important. It's like, Super important. that's what life is about. We all have different experiences. We all have our opinions and thoughts because of the information we've had. Right. Which can be completely different than someone else, but that doesn't totally mean you have to like. Right. You know, so I, I, it's been really sad for me to watch that. You know. Do you believe in free will? Uh, it's an interesting one. It's a whole new there. <laughs> well, so the, it's the, back re- into consciousness. Right. The reason I thought of it is because you, you kind of mentioned that like we all have different information or different experiences that we've lived and that informs us of how we see the world. And so, um, I, yeah, I, this is kind of like a, it's a weird question now because I've sort of come to a place where like, you know, there's traditionally a dichotomy of free will versus determinism. Right. Right. Yeah. But like, I also think that that dichotomy is kind of bullshit. It's like, more of like a a flowing between the two or something like that not that it's hard to explain it's kind of like nature nurture it's kind of a similar thing sure yeah it's kind of yes it's it's sort of both but it's like but i you know i don't ever want to ostracize anyone for the way that they view the world because like so much of it is dependent on like where you were born, when you were born, who you were born to, the genetics in your family line. Like all these things are going to influence so things, yeah. like the self or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, that's why that that question popped up in my head, I guess. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, it's a good question to ask ourselves too, you know? I mean, <clears throat> there's a really interesting kind of just the whole idea that, you know, just getting into, you know, plastic pollution, let's say, you know, the the big companies, Coca-Cola and all these companies that are producing all this plastic, they'll say, oh, well, the market will, you know, the market will, you know, make everything work in the end. If, If people don't want these products, they won't buy it. It's like, no, 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 no. You spend billions of dollars every single year manipulating people into thinking that they need these things right. from the time they're a little kid. So it's basically right. the same thing you're talking about. It's like, do you have free will when you go out and buy stuff and whatever? Or are you just working off of the subconscious programs that you've been seeing inundated over and over and 100%. over your entire life? So, 100%. Yeah, unless you stop and make a real conscious decision in your life on a daily basis moment to moment which is very difficult but unless you're doing that on a fairly regular basis yeah i don't know if you do have much free will honestly and the thing about it is is like you won't even know that you should stop unless somehow you've ran into some information or a person or material that's like yo maybe you should examine like all these underlying yeah, you know, like you said, programs running in your head that move your body from place to place and make you do these weird behaviors that if you sat there long enough and looked at them, you would sort of realize that they're kind of, they're kind of, you know, uh, provincial at best, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's always just interesting to me. Um it's it's something that I've sort of been hashing out on unsuspecting guests over the past several months. So thanks. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's it's a really interesting. I mean we didn't even really get into the whole concept of like well, I guess you kind of mentioned it, but just like God or yeah. whatever that might be. You know, like pre everything's predetermined or some kind of like, you don't actually have free will. 
or, or even just the idea that we're all living in like a holographic universe or everything's a hologram and yeah. everything's and we're in some fucking, you know, like we're in some video game created by some teenagers a thousand years in the future or something. I mean, <laughs> I could be too. I mean, fucking knows. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's so much to get into there. Maybe we'll save it for another, another podcast later down the nice. line. Um, but yeah, uh, we're about at an hour and a half and that's, I think that's a good round number to, to slow it down and, and, you know, taxi us in to the runway here. Um, one last question or one last prompt is, could you give some advice to young artists out there? I say wow because there's so many things I would say. Yeah. And I think what I would say to somebody 10 or 20 years ago would be very different than what I would say now. Um, just concerning like social media and all that stuff. Um, sure. I, I would say the one thing, maybe a couple things, but one thing for sure is kind of what we were just talking about, like check in with yourself and make sure that you're being true to yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's great to be influenced by other people mm -hmm. and find inspiration in other people. But like, what is it that you truly want to express? What is your truth? What is your vision? You know? Yeah. And, and to really tap into that and to pursue that and do the best you can and not worry about what other people are going to think, whether that's your friends or, you know, maybe you're in an art circle and you all kind of make similar art, but all of a sudden you have some idea that has nothing to do with that. And you really want to pursue that fucking pursue that shit. You know, Hell yeah. the world, the world needs that. Like if you're being true and you're being a true vessel for those things, like that's what the world needs. The world doesn't need a bunch of copycatters. Or... And I would also say to keep at it, you know? Yeah. hundred percent sacrifices. If it's something that you really are truly wanting to do, it's not an easy road, but personally, I would I wouldn't change it for anything that I could imagine. But hell yeah, just keep at it. I mean, even if you need to take a break for a couple months and get some inspiration, or just like take a step back from what you're doing to get some perspective, you know, like just make sure you come back to it. You know, if that's what you really want to be doing, just keep at it. I mean, that's that's been a thing that I've watched over the years. I've seen so many artists come and go. You know, like, and some of them are super talented and they come and boom for like a year or two and be on these shows and like make some really cool shit. And then they just kind of, maybe that was it for them, but I think they could have made some really amazing things. Um, so I'd say, yeah, don't get discouraged. Like, yeah, well, there's a lot of things I could say. I, I guess I was going to say with social media, don't try not to compare yourself. You know, it's really difficult, but try not to compare yourself or judge yourself too harshly against other people. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, sometimes I'll see other artists that I think are fucking amazing, you know, like they just draw so well and they paint so well and whatever. And then I'll watch an interview with them and it's like, Oh, they've been, they've been hey, oil painting. Sorry. One minute. I'm so sorry. It's okay. No worries. You can edit that out. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> you were saying so, yeah. something. So basically, yeah. It's like, you know, I'll, I'll start comparing myself to this person and be like, uh, and I'll be like, well, you know, I'm not, I haven't put in that time probably. And then you f come to find out like, oh, their parent was an art teacher and they've been oil painting since they were five or something. I mean, right. Duh, of course they're that good, you know, or whatever it is. So there's always like some backstories to things and, you know, maybe someone was, you know, grew up wealthy and they had a lot of things given to them that you just didn't or, <clears throat> or vice versa. There's just so many ways to, with social media just to like judge yourself and get down on yourself. So I would say tr do your best just to like, just don't fall into that trap, you know, just for but sure. Ultimately, just, you know, staying true to yourself. Yeah. As you can. You know? Yeah. And I, I think that in, in life in general too, just try to be honest and true with yourself and with other people. And, and also just this whole thing we were just talking about, you know, it's like people have, differing opinions with you just try to be open with that and be cool with it you don't have to you know agree or whatever it is or necessarily want to hang out with them but you don't have to be a dick either yeah so totally solid advice 
comparisons to Thief of Joy is, uh, I don't know who said yeah. that. Somebody did. Um, so wise, wise singing. Yeah. And just keep in mind that like, yeah, everybody comes from different places, you know, like, and of course people are going to think differently than you. And, yeah. and that's what makes, I mean, can we not, <clears throat> can we just not celebrate the differences between us instead of finding fault or yeah. demonizing them? You know, I mean, that's what makes the, the world a great place is that there are all these different cultures and different. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, of course, unless their culture means that they're going to come and try and chop your head off with an axe, well, then maybe do something about that. But... <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> For yeah. sure. Well, Nomi, thank you so much. Again, thank really you. appreciate you uh, taking the time out to to talk with us here today, you know, and um, I, I hope everybody got something good out of that. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you again for listening to another episode of RTAF Podcast. If you are interested in supporting the Patreon, that address is patreon.com slash RTAF Podcast. And I want to thank all my patrons. You guys keep this engine running. I couldn't do it without you. Go over there and check out the tiers I have available. It includes video, uh, guest suggestions, uh, patron-only posts, and some merchandise. Thank you again for listening. Please rate, review, subscribe. Do all those little things that help get RTAF into the consciousness of more and more people. Shout out.